don't know if any of the rest of you watch Strictly. Don't pretend that you are too cool for it. But there was a really, really cool dance last week that was their first same-sex dance, which was really amazing. So anyway, I was reading about it on the Pink News website. And as I scroll down below the article, I'm presented with reams of classic clickbait. I mean sponsored posts. Uh, like, Cork, want to get the latest Vista hearing? Dot, 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 whatever that means. 25 celebs you didn't realize are gay. Number eight will surprise women. Drink this before going to bed to help burn belly fat. And the clickbait itself is actually quite revealing through its chosen topics alone. I mean, it knew I was in Cork. Um, it knows the broad subject matter of the content that I'm reading, and so perhaps I will be interested in the surprising gay men um, and suspects I'm a woman. Uh, and, well, who doesn't feel targeted by ads about belly fat? So this clickbait is provided to Pink News by Taboola. And on this page alone, Taboola is requested through 14 scripts, 23 images, two style sheets, and five frames. And I work on blocking trackers uh, with a privacy tool that I make called Better Blocker. And we've looked into Taboola. And in our crawls of like, all the most popular sites on the web, we found Taboola was on nearly 5% of all popular websites. So Taboola itself, its aim is to drive marketing results by targeting your audience when they are most receptive to new messages. And you can do that with data-rich recommendations. Ensure that your brand reaches interested people by leveraging the massive amount of user data powering the Taboola engine. And they provide a kind of handy graphic, which is very hard to read because they've put text in an image, um, showing some of the information that might be like, useful about a site's visitor. So the device and operating system, like we're used to that, or whether they're in the market for a car or fashion or an electric bike, and whether they have an interest in pet lovers or environment or entertainment or science and tech. And so I'm like, well, I want to know what Taboola is collecting about me. So I scroll down the page to find the privacy policy. It's always in tiny text that they wish was invisible. And see what they're going to do with it. And oh, they actually do have third-party online advertising specific privacy policy. So I go look at that. And they say, we automatically collect user information when users interact with our services that appear on our customers' websites and digital properties. Taboola collects only pseudonymized data, which means we do not know who you are because we do not know or process your name, email address, or other identifiable data. Let's debunk this for a second. <laughs> Because pseudonymized data or anonymized data doesn't mean you're unidentifiable. I mean, even though privacy policies have been hanging off this whole thing for years, as Bruce Schneier once said, good security expert, he said a decade ago in Wired, it takes only a small named database, or a database that actually has names in, for someone to pry the anonymity off a much larger anonymous database. They just need to compare the data points. And a recent study, I mean, it's not the only study, into methods to re-identify individuals from anonymized data sets found that using our model, we found 99.98% of Americans would be correctly re-identified in any data set using 15 demographic attributes. So that could be age, or gender, or ethnicity, or postcode, or number of children, or number of cars owned, or location, and like status updates, and maybe results on a personality quiz. And so I go back to Taboola's privacy policy. And I want to know how uh, the interest that Taboola infers actually compares to these kinds of demographic attributes. Because Taboola calls them data segments. And a data segment is a grouping of users who share one or more attributes, e.g. travel enthusiasts. And we offer a number of data segments, both proprietary and from our data partners. So I'm like, who are their data partners? Two of them stand out to me in particular, Axiom and Oracle. 
And the reason they stand out to me is because I read a lot of stuff that crack labs do. And they've done multiple reports and research into the personal data that corporations collect and combine and analyze and trade and use. And the data brokers that actually deal in that data, featuring two of the biggest data brokers, Oracle and Axiom. And so according to Crack Labs, Axiom provides up to 3,000 attributes and scores on 700 million people in the US, Europe, and other regions. And Oracle sorts people into thousands of categories and provides more than 30,000 attributes on 2 billion consumer profiles. But what are these attributes and categories? So I picked out some of the creepiest bits of information because you're not going to be able to read it on here. Um, one of nearly 200 ethnic codes, political views, relationship status, income, the details about banking and insurance policies, the type of home you have, including whether your home is a prison, uh, the likelihood whether a person is planning to have a baby or adopt a child, the number and age of their children, their purchases, including whether a person bought pain relief products, uh, whether a person is likely to have an interest in the Air Force or the Army or the Navy or the lottery and the sweepstakes or gay and lesbian movies, and search history, including whether a person searched about abortion or legalizing drugs or gay marriage, or protests, or strikes, or boycotts, or riots. And the likelihood of whether someone is a social influencer, or is likely to be socially influenced. Tabula so says, it does not knowingly create segments that are based upon what we consider to be sensitive information. But what is sensitive information? So helpfully, they actually provide a, data, a detailed list of all their apparently not sensitive, standard health segments. And I've picked out some more that jump out at me as being quite personal. Active health management, far below average. Health, I have no confidence in the healthcare system. Family and planning, motherhood, artificial insemination. First sign of pain, I take medication. Health and fitness, addiction. Health and fitness disorders, panic, anxiety. Personality, dealing with stress, bottled up. Dealing with stress, emotional. Dealing with stress, quick fix. This isn't exactly the kind of information that we want marketers to use to sell to us. And these personality attributes were also used by Cambridge Analytica. And they collected them through a personality test app on <coughs> Facebook. They also, pardon me, that harvested the profiles of the participants' friends and their friends' friends. So in this personality test app, users were scored on big five personality traits, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And in exchange, 40% of them consented to access to their Facebook profiles. Cambridge Analytica itself claimed to be able to analyze huge amounts of consumer data and combine that with behavioral science to identify people who organizations can target with marketing material. It collected data from a wide range of sources, including social media platforms such as Facebook and its own polling. I mean, this is profiling. And Cambridge Analytica was a venture of SCL Elections, whose expertise was in psychological operations, or PSYOPs, changing people's minds not through persuasion, but through informational dominance, a set of techniques that includes rumor, disinformation, and fake news. So that's targeting. And SCL worked with Steve Bannon on the Trump election campaign. And as this neat little graphic from The Guardian shows, SEL's ventures, Cambridge Analytica and Aggregate IQ, worked on multiple Brexit leave campaigns. So we, as citizens, are being manipulated <coughs> by the profiling and the targeting. And this is all the topic of a really good documentary on Netflix, it's called The Great Hack. I'd really recommend it if you want a lot of information without having to do any of the reading. Um, and it's also really accessible for people who aren't so techy. And it means I'm not exaggerating when I say that tracking affects democracy. And if we use tracking, we have to consider its ethical implications. 
So I could talk about this in more depth forever, but I've only got a limited amount of time. But if you want a, a proper read, try the book Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. And it contains both the history and the predicted future of these massive complex surveillance systems. Shoshana Zuboff herself coined the term surveillance capitalism and describes it in the book, surveillance capitalism unilaterally claims human experience as free raw material for translation into behavioral data. Although some of these data are applied to product or service improvement, the rest are fabricated into prediction products that anticipate what you will do now, soon, and later. <coughs> and if that sounds like it's a bit academic for you and you, want, you don't want to read a book that's really that thick, um, you can listen to the, one of the episodes of the Adam Buxton podcast because he interviewed Shoshana Zuboff recently and it's a really good listen. So many people will argue that profiling and targeting is okay because it makes technology so convenient for the majority of us. Thing is, convenient unethical technology is like fluffy handcuffs. They might look cute and fluffy, they might lead to some fun, but they're still handcuffs, <laughs> and you want to have access to the key to those handcuffs. So how can we look at protecting ourselves as individuals? I've got a few things here. It's not an exhaustive list. Avoid logging in, if you can. So if you're watching a video on YouTube, don't log in. But then actually, many platforms will still track you through fingerprinting, that combination of unique identifiers that the browser can tell about you. So things like your browser height and width, um, the devices you're using, and ironically, whether you have do not track it <laughs> like enabled in your browser. In 2015, Facebook even filed a patent saying it could identify people who might know each other because they appear in photos taken by the same camera. And they know which camera it is by identical lens scratches and dust. Avoid providing your phone number to these platforms. They, people always recommend using two-factor authentication for security. It's a good idea. Um, like protect your account from strangers and all that. But phone numbers are actually quite risky for authentication. A study into whether Facebook used personally identifiable information for targeted advertising found that when we added and verified a phone number for two-factor authentication to one of the author's accounts, the phone number became targetable by advertising after 22 days. And not long ago, Twitter admitted it did exactly the same thing, except they worded it like it was a mistake. When an advertiser uploaded their marketing list, we may have matched people on Twitter to their list based on the email or phone number the Twitter account holder provided for safety and security purposes. You could disallow third-party cookies in your browser preferences. Um, most of us know that if you blocked third-party resources on most of our sites, it breaks a lot of things. Um, and likewise, most things just fall apart when you block third-party cookies. Uh, and usually falls apart silently, so you have no <laughs> idea what is going on. Particularly if you've got anything persistent going on on your site, like logins and preferences and baskets for shopping. They'll all probably break. Don't use Gmail. Uh, your email not only contains all of your communication, but the receipts for everything you've bought, the confirmations of every event you've ever signed up for, uh, every platform and newsletter or service that you've joined. Um, and something I discovered this week, because I don't use Chrome, is that it, they also keep you logged in uh, when you log in on your email in the Chrome browser so they can suck up your search history and all that as well. From our own crawls of the web for BetterBlocker, we discovered that Google has its tentacles in around 80% of the popular web. Now you think about all the information that Google could collect about you across 80% of the web. Though, if your friends and family use Gmail, well, you're a bit stuck. And likewise, like, the choices that we make also affect our friends and family because they still have access to what you're emailing. So these are all choices we can make when we're on the web, but we need to be aware of all the other places we can be tracked as well. Like Google Nest knows everything about your home. Amazon Ring and Alexa can hear everything you're saying and spy on your neighbors for you. Hello Barbie knows all your kids' secrets. A smart pacifier means you can put a chip in your baby. 
Of course, it was only a matter of time before someone made a smart menstrual cup. They love making smart things that women put inside themselves, including the smart dildo. We Connect, the smart dildo makers, were actually sued for tracking users' habits. And have you ever wondered how many calories you're burning during intercourse? How many thrusts? The speed of your thrusts? The duration of your sessions and the frequency? How many different positions you use in the period of a week, month, or year? You want the eye condom. And have you ever wanted to share all of that very intimate information with advertisers, insurers, your government, I mean, who knows else? It all seems like a lot of work to avoid all of this. I mean, these are just a few of the things we can do, and I don't even do those things, and I'm a person who goes around advocating for privacy. And that's why it's unfair to blame the victim for having their privacy eroded, because we're actually having our concept of privacy twisted by the people who have an agenda to benefit from that. One of the biggest culprits in trying to redefine the definition of privacy is Facebook. So here's a Facebook ad that you might have seen on TV or in the cinema recently. It shows a person like, undressing behind towels with the help of their friends alongside the Facebook post visibility options. They're saying you could share it publicly, share with friends, only me or just close friends. And the ad like, ends saying, oh, well, we all have different privacy settings in life. There's a lot of way to control your privacy settings on Facebook. I think what it fails to show is that friends and only me and close friends should really say friends and Facebook, only me and Facebook, and close friends and Facebook. Because you're never really sharing something with just yourself on Facebook. Facebook Inc. is always there watching you. Oh, sorry, I didn't have time to Photoshop the uh, new logo in because that makes a hell of a lot of difference. <laughs> Privacy is the ability to choose what you want to share with others and what you want to keep to yourself. As straightforward as that. And Facebook shouldn't be telling us otherwise. Google also have an interesting interpretation of privacy. Ten years ago, Eric Schmidt, who was then the CEO of Google, now the executive chairman of Alphabet, Google's parent corporation, famously said, if you have something you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. To which I respond, yeah, sure, okay, Eric. Tell me about the last time you went to the toilet then. I mean, we should perhaps be smart about what we're sharing publicly, but like, don't go sh like, sharing photos of your credit card online, posting your address. Maybe it's unwise to share a photo of yourself blackout drunk the week before you have an interview. Maybe we should take responsibility if we say something awful to another person online. But right now, the corporations are more than happy to blame us for this loss of privacy. They say we agreed to the terms and conditions and we should read the privacy policies. It's all our fault. And this in itself was the topic of a whole documentary back in 2013 called Terms and Conditions May Apply, covering the ridiculous terms, all the legalese in these policies, and, and how we couldn't possibly read them for every single service we're using all the time. And more recently, an editorial board co-op in uh, op-ed in the New York Times pointed out the flaws in privacy policies for consent. The clicks that pass for consent are uninformed, non-negotiated, and offered in exchange for services that are often unnecessary, are often necessary for civic life. And there are even studies that speak to how difficult it is to understand these policies. Like two law professors analyzed the sign-in terms and conditions of 500 popular US websites, including Google and Facebook, and found that more than 99% of them were unreadable, far exceeding the level that most American adults read at, but are still enforced. It's not informed consent when you can't understand the terms. And how can we truly consent if we don't know how our information can be used against us? It's not true consent if it's not a real choice either. We're not asked like, who should be allowed access to our information and how much information and how often and for how long and when. Like this fresh hell from Huffington Post. <laughs> I mean, so they've got this because of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation because it requires that they ask for consent before tracking you. So I 
get this when I want to read a post. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and opt out of this. So I choose manage. Manage options gives me a whole long list of text that is saying exactly what it said on the first screen uh, and not much else. So then I, so I choose manage again. I'm given these options with uh, sort of another load of text that says absolutely nothing. Um, but I want to see how the partners use my data. Maybe there I will have some control over it. So I hit show. And then I get to this page where in order to actually see how they're using my data, I have to hover over a tiny little I and I get some more text that says pretty much nothing, but this time on a blue background. And so I select hide on that. And then I actually go to the next one down and it gives me a list of all of the third party services they use and their privacy policies. No way to opt out, nothing like that. And most of those privacy policies don't even have reference to the third party use of their products. So at no point was there a choice for me. Right? Nothing that even resembles consent. Just a lot of text that just says the same thing over and over again until you just give up and say, okay, fine, I'll, that's fine. We're asked to give up everything or get nothing. And that's not a real choice. It's certainly not a real choice when the cost of not consenting is to lose access to social, civil, and labor infrastructure. There's a recent paper by Jan Fernbach and Gwen Schaffer called Cell Phone Security and Social Capital, and it examines the privacy trade-offs that disproportionately affect mobile, mostly, internet users. And what they found really shows the cost of not giving consent. Like, so speaking about this paper, Gwen Schaffer explained, all individuals are vulnerable to security breaches, identity fraud, system errors, and hacking. But economically disadvantaged individuals who rely exclusively on their mobile phones to access the internet are disproportionately exploited. Some focus group participants reported that in an effort to maintain data privacy, they modify online activities in ways that harm personal relationships and force them to forego job opportunities. The technology we use is our new everyday things. It forms that vital civil and social and labor infrastructure. And as kind of helpless consumers, there's not really that much we can do to protect ourselves without having a lot of free time and a lot of money. And when the technology you use is a lifeline to access, you're way more impacted by the unethical decisions of these products. So last year, Dr. Frances Ryan covered this in her article, The Missing Link, Why Disabled People Can't Afford to Hashtag Delete Facebook. And so after the Cambridge Analytica scandal, a lot of people were going around saying hashtag delete Facebook. I mean, they're doing it again at the moment. But as Dr. Frances Ryan pointed out, I can't help but wonder if only privileged people can afford to take a position of social media puritanism. For many, particularly people from marginalized groups, social media is a lifeline, a bridge to a new community, a route to employment, and a way to tackle isolation. And like so many of the issues we have with technology, what we're actually dealing with is the underlying social and systemic issues. And as technologists, we can't really help ourselves by trying to solve every single problem that we have with more technology. Uh, but technology can't fix the issues of domination or oppression or discrimination. In fact, it often makes them much worse because we amplify and we speed up the impact of these issues with technology. Mike and Annie recently made the point in an article about tech platforms that we kind of seem to operate with the notion that online life is somehow different from the rest of our lives and kind of detached from our everyday existence. And tech platforms really take advantage of that notion by suggesting that, you know, well, if you don't like the technology, uh, you can log out, you can log off, you can go be mindful or do something like that. These, I think people with that mindset really show how shallow they are. And if they say, oh, if you don't like the technology, you don't have to use it. Because we can't escape the technology. Platforms are societies of intertwined people and machines. There is no such thing as online life versus real life. We give massive ground if we pretend that these companies are simply having an effect or an impact on some separate society. 
Which brings me to another issue rife in technology today, technology colonialism. So Anhan Simmons wrote a really long and detailed article about this in Model View Culture five years ago. And he started with a little bit of history about colonialism, which, I mean, we certainly need it here. Colonial powers always saw themselves as superiors over the native people whose culture was rarely recognized or respected. The colonizers saw economic value in foreign relations, but it was always viewed as a transaction based on inequality. And then he compared it to I mean, what we so often do in technology. Technology companies continue the same philosophy in how they present their own products. These products are almost always designed by white men for a global audience with little understanding of the diverse interests of end users. And we have to reckon with our colonial history, eh, both politically, but also in the tech industry and in our community. We have to reckon with the colonial way in which we create technology. Like, we don't speak to users. Like, instead, we use analytics and data to design interfaces for people we'll probably never try to speak to and never ask them if they actually wanted the technology in the first place. We'll assume we know best because we are the experts and th they are just users. We don't have diverse teams. It, we barely even try to involve people with backgrounds different from our own. And we fetishize our tools, valuing the developer experience over the user experience. And we could say we have the right intentions and we were trying to do the right thing, but it honestly means nothing. Like, this has been explored recently in depth by Tatiana Mack, who invokes intent does not erase impact to describe like, how haphazardly we just design products without thinking about the impact. And we not only have a responsibility to design more ethical technology, but to consider the impact that our design has outside of its immediate interface. As the people advocating for change, it can be really difficult doing this because you can't go around telling people to stop using technology if no alternatives to that technology exists. And that's why I like to talk to people like you. <laughs> because as the people who work in technology and who create technology, we actually have a lot more power to make change. And we can encourage more ethical practice and we can build these alternatives. So how might we build more ethical technology? Well, as an antidote to big tech, we need to build small technology. Everyday tools for everyday people designed to increase human welfare, not corporate profits. I mean, that sounds pretty lofty, um, but there are some quite practical ways to approach it. First off, just make it easy to use. Like, plenty of privacy-respecting tools exist for nerds like us. I use some of them. But we mustn't make protecting ourselves some kind of privilege that you only have if you have the knowledge or the time or the money. It's why we need to make easy-to-use technology that is functional, and I include accessibility because if it is not accessible, it is not functional, convenient and reliable. We need to make it inclusive. We must ensure people have equal rights and access to the tools we build and the communities who build them. And with a particular focus on including people from already marginalized groups. And to be fair, most of the tools that we have, whether they're privacy respecting or not, are generally terrible at this. We don't make inclusive technology and we surround ourselves with very toxic communities. We should not be colonial in what we're designing. Our teams should reflect the intended audience of our technology. If we can't build like teams like this, some of us are work as sort of individuals or in very small groups, we must ensure that the people with different needs from our own can take what we've built and make it work for them. We can build upon like the best practices and the shared experiences of others, but we shouldn't be making like, assumptions about what is suitable for an audience that we're not a part of. We need to make it personal. So we've got to stop our infatuation with growth and greed and focus on building technology that is for everyday people and not just making more and more tools and spending all our focus and all our energy and all of our experience on stuff for startups and enterprises. We need to make it private by default. I'm saying it again because I want to undo all of Facebook's privacy washing. Privacy is the ability to choose what you want to share with others and what you want to keep to yourself. And make your technology functional without personal information at all. 
You don't need to know a person's gender to provide a service to them. You don't need analytics that segment people into stereotypes. We need to allow people to share their information for relevant functionality only with their explicit consent. So when obtaining consent, we need to tell a person how we'll use their information, when we'll use it, who will have access to it, and how long we're going to keep that information stored. And this has recently become something that is required under the GDPR. We need to write easy to understand privacy policies. Don't just copy the privacy policy that somebody else is using, because they probably copied it off somebody else, and it's completely irrelevant to what you provided. And every time we add a new feature or update what we're building, we make sure that the privacy policy reflects that and actually is up to date with it. Don't use third-party consent frameworks. They, most of them aren't GDPR compliant. They're awful experiences, and they'll likely just get you into legal trouble. Don't use third-party <coughs> services if you can avoid them, because they present a risk to both you and your users. Like innocent little web fonts. So last week, people were discussing how Crashlytics have been using custom fonts to track people in iOS. And uh, this great tweet from the CSS Tricks Twitter account correctly pointed out, that's the entire reason behind Google web fonts. They're not giving you fonts out of the kindness of their googly little hearts. And if you do use third-party services, make it your responsibility to know their terms and their policies, know what information they're taking from your visitors, what they're collecting, and what they're doing with it. And if you use third-party scripts and content delivery networks and videos and images and fonts and all of these things, self-host them. And if you don't think there's a way of self-hosting them, ask the people who are providing the tech, can I self-host it? And it's probably worth mentioning a little bit of social media etiquette. Uh, like, if you know how, strip the tracking identifiers and Google AMP junk out of your URLs before you share them with people. Friends don't let friends get tracked by corporations. <laughs> and if you feel like you need a presence on social media or on blogging platforms, don't make it the only option. Post it to your own site first and mirror those posts onto, that, onto the stuff that you want to get exposure on. <coughs> your basic blog is way better than medium. <laughs> Make it zero knowledge. Zero knowledge tech has no knowledge of your information. It may store a person's information, but the people who make or host the tech can't access that information if they wanted to. And keep their information on their device wherever possible. And if a person's information needs to be synced to another device, ensure that information is end-to-end -end encrypted with the person only having access to decrypt it. No one else has access to decrypt it. The adage is true. The cloud is just somebody else's computer. And we need to take care with how we share our technology, how we sustain its existence. We need to make it share alike. We need to cultivate a healthier commons by using licenses that actually allow people to build upon what we've done and share their changes back into what we're building. Not doing all this stuff with building all this stuff for big tech and then letting them use it and shut it off and make it proprietary, and nobody ever gets to benefit from those changes. We also have to take care with how we share our technology and how we sustain its existence, make it non-commercial. Support stay-ups and not startups. My partner, Earl, coined the term stay-up as the kind of anti-startup. We don't need more tech companies aiming to fail fast or sell out as quickly as possible. We need long-term sustainable technology. support not-for-profit technology. If we're building sustainable technology for everyday people, we need a compatible funding model, not venture capital and, or equity-based investment. And this might feel like difficult or even impossible to do, and to some degree, it probably is. But there are ways that we can give ourselves the opportunity to build more ethical technology. Using small technology, perhaps, as the criteria when you're looking for your next job. Like, if your current job is not great, next time you're looking, try and find a better one. Seek alternatives to the software that we use every day. Switching.software is a really good site that lists a lot of 
um, ethical alternatives to technology by people who actually care about it and care about things that are easy to use. And if you can't do it at work, do it at home. If you have the time, make your own personal website and practice small technology on that. So I'll just show you very quickly about what my personal site runs on, which is a little tool called Site.js that we're building so you can have a secure personal website without all of the config and complication and without re relying on third-party services who might try to track your data and all that stuff without your consent or pivoting to a dodgy business model. And you can create a little baby web page, uh, install Site.js and set up... Oh, and set up like a whole production server in less than 30 seconds. HTTPS certificates and everything. And it's designed to be easy enough for me to use because I am, hate writing stuff in terminal. I can't remember commands ever. And this is taking slightly longer than 30 seconds. Oh, it's not even going. It's certainly taking a lot longer than 30 seconds though because of all the comments that are going through explaining how to do it. So it made a little baby web page, go to Site.js website, install it, just copy it. <coughs> All done. Starting a production server just by going site enable. And it's up and running. And you just go through to the browser, it takes a little minute because it's performing the TLS handshake that's just setting the certificates right away. That only happens the first time. And then you've got it, little baby web page, that quickly. And it also includes things like live reload and automatic server reloads, which means you can like, use it to test sites cross browser as well, cross device. And it can be used as a proxy server as well. So I use it with Hugo, although I'm looking maybe 11T, I'm eyeing it up. And yes, it also runs on a Raspberry Pi, so you can run it in the palm of your hand off 4G. And there's no tracking. And you could get stats about who's visiting your sites and see what pages are popular and everything, what pages are missing, um, with a cryptographically secure URL. And um, you can share this URL with whoever you want. I mean, I'm not gonna share my URL with you because you can see from here all of the problems with my website and it's like letting you into my knicker drawer. <laughs> so I've been speaking about tracking and privacy for around seven years now. And luckily it is getting more mainstream and people are starting to care about it a lot more. But I've been heckled by a loyal Google employee. I've been called a tinfoil hat wearing ranter by a Facebook employee. I've had people just tell me there isn't any other way to build technology, and I'm just trying to impede the natural progress of tech. And as Rose Everleth recently wrote in a post on Vox, the assertion that technology companies can't possibly be shaped or restrained with public's interest in mind is to argue that they are fundamentally different from any other industry. They're not. We're not special. We can't keep making poor excuses for bad practices. We need to divest ourselves of our ethical organizations. Like, consider who we're financially supporting. Consider who we are lending our endorsement to when we share cool stuff that we like or advertise things for a company. I'm sorry, I don't give a shit about all the cool stuff coming out of unethical companies. Like, it doesn't matter. You're not an example to be held above anybody else. Your work is actually hurting the world, not helping it. And our whole approach matters. It's not just about how we build technology, but our approach to being part of communities who build technology. And you might be thinking, I'm just one person though, I can't do very much. But we're an industry with many communities, with many groups made up of many persons. And if we work together on this, we could have an impact. We have to remember that we're more than just our job. Like, if you work for a big corporation that does unethical stuff, I mean, you probably didn't make the decision to do that bad thing, but I think the time has come that we can't unquestioningly defend our employers. We need to use our social capital, or privilege, to be the change we want to exist. And I think perhaps this whole thing was a lot more than eight unbelievable things about tracking, so I thought I might finish off with eight very believable ways you can make change happen. One, 
be independent. We've got to be comfortable being different. We can't just follow other people's leads when those other people aren't being good leaders. Don't look to the heroes that can let you down. And don't be loyal to big corporations who just don't care about you. Be the advisor. Do the research on inclusive ethical technology. Make recommendations to others. Make it harder for them to make excuses. Be the advocate. Marginalized folks shouldn't have to risk themselves to make change. We need to advocate for other people. Advocate for the underrepresented. Be the questioner. Question the defaults. Ask a startup how it makes its money. Ask why someone has built tracking into their product. Be the gatekeeper. When advocacy isn't enough, use your expertise to prevent unethical things from happening on your watch. You don't have to deploy a website. Be difficult. Be the person who is always known for bringing up the same stuff over and over again. Embrace the awkwardness, because that means you have power. Call out the questionable behavior. And be unprofessional. Don't let anybody tell you that you're going to get things done if you're a bit nicer and if you smile more. It, it's not unprofessional to care about the needs of yourself and the needs of others. And don't let people tell you to be quiet. And be the supporter. If you're not comfortable speaking up for yourself, at least be there for those who do. Remember that silence is complicity. And speaking up is risky and hard, and it can be really fucking lonely. And we're often fighting entities that are far bigger than ourselves. And our lives and our ability to make a living are at risk. But letting technology continue this way is riskier. Like society and democracy riskier. So people always say that the talks I give are scary. <laughs> but I'm not here to scare you. I'm just here because I want to tell you that we deserve better. Thank you. <laughs>